Hello and welcome to episode 4 of It's Old News 250. This may be news to you, but it's old news. Last week, we talked about Bostonians meeting at Fenuel Hall, about what to do with the tea that has lately arrived at the harbor there. It was decided that the tea would be sent back to London and no duty would be paid on the tea. Reverend John Moorhead, deceased. He was the reverend of the Church of the Presbyterian Strangers in Boston uh, since 1730. The ship arrives in Philadelphia. Does it have tea on board? The ship Montague arrived and before any of the pilots in Philadelphia or anyone would go on board the ship, it needed to be determined if there was tea on board. Um, turns out that this was not one of the tea ships, but it kind of showed the level of um, commitment that the, the cities were taking on making sure that no tea uh, was coming into the harbor and landing in the cities. And then finally, a mechanic's plea about the Tea Act. This was a handbill uh, written by uh, a mechanic in the city of Philadelphia to the other tradesmen in the city, um, outlining his reasons on why the Tea Act should be opposed and citing his fears and predictions on what would happen if it were allowed and uh, what it meant for the future. All right, let's get started on this week's episode. News from America. Boston, Massachusetts news. December 2nd, 1773, Captain Bruce arrives. Captain Bruce has arrived from London with the detestable tea on board his ship. The ship lies at the same wharf as Captain Hall's ship so that the watchman can easily watch both ships. The following notification was posted up in several parts of the town on the same day. Whereat it has been reported that a permit will be given by the Custom House for the landing of the tea commanded by Captain Hall. This is to remind the public that it was solemnly voted by the body of the people of this and the neighboring towns assembled at the Old South Meeting House on Tuesday, the 30th day of November, that the said tea never should be landed in this province or pay one farthing of duty. And as the aiding or assisting in procuring or granting any such permit for landing the said tea or any other tea so circumstanced or in offering any permit when obtained to the master or commander of the said ship or any other ship in the same situation must betray an inhuman thirst for blood and will also in a great measure accelerate confusion and civil war. This is to assure such public enemies of this country that they will be considered and treated as wretches unworthy to live and will be made the first victims of our just resentment. December 4th, 1773, Captain Coffin arrives. Since our last arrived here, Captain Coffin, not only with the plague tea on board, but also with the smallpox. As tea is of a drawing quality, tis suspected it has sucked in the distemper, and therefore, if permitted to be landed, tis presumed there would be no purchaser. The East India Company tea commissioners all remain secluded at Castle William. Their stubbornness has made them infinitely more obnoxious to their countrymen than even the stamp masters were. Their zeal in the cause against the liberties of America must be allowed to be indeed singular, for which their names will be transmitted to posterity with tenfold infamy. If Mr. Roch, the owner of Captain Hall's ship, does not intend to depart directly with the tea she brought, he had to explicitly declare it, so the people may know what to depend on and how to conduct themselves. It does not appear that she is yet ready or that he has even made a demand at the custom house for a clearance. The minds of the public are greatly irritated at his delay to take the necessary steps towards complying with their peremptory requisition. So now this makes two more ships that have arrived at Boston with tea, in addition to Captain Hall's. December 4th, 1773. A ranger ready to fight. I hear we must fight for our rights, as all other methods fail. 
I have in former years marched against the French and Native American when they attempted to enslave us, and I am ready to fight the enemies from Britain as Native Americans from Canada. Now, Monsieur Printers, I would have you inform any countrymen that I think it will be best to let all our enemies land without opposition, and we can both fight them and cut off their officers very easily, and this way we can subdue them with very little loss. You may remember how the French and Indian fought General Braddock's army. That's the way we must manage our enemies, and we shall meet with no difficulty, I warrant. A ranger. Powder Horn Hill, December 4th. So, I know I um, had heard about General Braddock before when learning about the French and Indian War, um, and but reading this one little article set me down a bit of a rabbit hole um, when I was putting this episode together to look up um, what exactly they're meaning about. You may remember how the French and Indians fought General Braddock's army and also about uh, if, if, there, if there was anything about this powder horn hill. So let's see what, uh, what I found here. General Edward Braddock was commander in chief of the British North American forces during the start of the French and Indian War. He was killed in 1755 while attempting to take Fort Duquesne, which is which was located at modern downtown Pittsburgh. General Braddock led 1,400 troops that day and engaged 300 to 900 French and Indians shortly after crossing the Monongahela River. It was a devastating rout of the British forces, with 456 killed and 422 wounded, and Braddock was mortal, mortally wounded. George Washington actually saved the day by regain, regaining some order amongst the regular troops. And then Powderhorn Hill is a hill that exists in Chelsea, Massachusetts, near Boston. And tradition says that Powderhorn Hill was sold for a horn of powder, but this cannot be traced to an authentic source. The hill was actually used during the Revolutionary War to give signals to the people in Roxbury and Cambridge about British movements in Boston. During the winter of 1775-6, to six, three companies of colonial troops had their quarters on the south side. The top of the hill was purchased by the state in 1897, set aside to be a public park forever. Today, there is a veteran's home and a hospital located on the top of the hill. Boston, December 16th, 1773, the first report of the Tea Party. We hear from Boston that last Thursday evening between 300 and 400 boxes of the celebrated East India Tea by some accident, which happened in an attempt to get it on shore, fell overboard, that the boxes burst open and the tea was swallowed up in the vast abyss. News from Charleston, South Carolina. December 13th, 1773, Charlestown Happenings. Last Monday, Robert Dalway Halliday was sworn in as collector of His Majesty's customs in this port, and he intends to follow the example of the late Hector Berenger de Bolfain, who died in 1766 and had a marble monument built in his honor in 1767. Now, I couldn't find any indication that a marble statue of Hector still exists today in Charleston, uh, which isn't really surprising, but there is a Beaufain Street, which could be named after Hector. William Mason, who was sometimes since appointed notary public at Georgetown, has lately received another commission from the lieutenant governor in regard to the entering and clearing of vessels at the port. William Nesbitt, who was lately appointed Deputy Secretary of this province, is now also Deputy Register of the Court of Ordinary. Last Thursday, there was a general meeting of the gentlemen in trade of this town at Mrs. Swallow's when it was proposed that a Chamber of Commerce should be formed. John Savage was chosen chairman and a committee of 21 appointed. Last Saturday, a number of horses arrived here from Halifax, belonging to our new governor, His Excellency Lord William Campbell. 
The new theater in this town is to be open on Monday next with A Word to the Wise and High Life Below Stairs. And the price of rice seems now to be fixed at 60 shillings per 100 pound, and the best indigo sells from 30 shillings to 32 shillings, $6 per pound. This is in response to a recent article that I saw that stated there was not enough ships to carry away all the rice in Charleston, and that the price was not yet set. News from New York City. December 2nd, 1773, regarding the Tea Act. Letters were received by the packet, appointing the Honorable Henry White, Abraham Lott, and Mr. Benjamin Booth, merchant of this city, to be agents for the sale of the tea shipped for this province by the East India Company. But there being a general opposition to the sale of it, as it stands charged with a duty payable in the colonies, those gentlemen have declined receiving it, in consequence of which it will be taken into the protection of government and deposited in the lower barracks. So compared to what the merchants in Boston did, where they basically gave excuses as to why they couldn't give up their commission and had to basically accept being consigned to the, of the tea, these men in New York City uh, refused um, being agents for the sale of the tea. Queries. Respecting the Tea Act, submitted to the most serious consideration of every person in America. Query. As there is an act of the British Parliament in being that would subjugate America to three pence sterling duty upon every pound weight of tea imported from Britain, and as this duty is voted independent of, and without the sanction of any of our American parliaments, what ought to be done unto every one of these traitorous persons, who shall aid or abet the importation of or landing the said tea in any part of America, till that act is totally repealed jointly by king, lords, and commons? Answer. Such base traitors to this country, without exception, should immediately and resolutely be dragged from concealment. They should be transported or forced from every place in America, loaded with the most striking badges of disgrace. Particularly, we ought not to forget Jack on both sides, the deceitful, lying, infamous Poplicola. For in this case, all such may absolutely and justly be deemed as public robbers of our liberty, property, and peace. Query. What will be the most effectual methods of proceeding to obtain a repeal of the said oppressive, unconstitutional act? Answer. To use no tea, at least for the present, for if any person should give to the sellers more than the usual price for tea, he ought to be held up as a mortal enemy to American freedom. And brave Americans, O oh, ye brave men, in whom we still may find a love of virtue, freedom, and mankind, Go forth, in majesty of woe arrayed, see at your feet your country kneels for aid. Be as one man, concord, success ensues, there's not an honest heart but what is yours. Go forth you must, ye cannot be withstood, be your hearty honest as your cause is good. Query, what will be the consequence of a ministerial illegal suspension of the Tea Act? or of receiving or storing the said tea in any way or manner whatever, until the British Parliament shall be pleased to recognize the matter. Answer. It will be dreadful. It will be productive, innumerable, and excessive bad consequences. A suspending power is the most dangerous of all powers. We must universally bear our testimony and hold up our hands firmly against it. Reject the tea firmly, for when it is landed, there will be inevitably be an incessant uproar, such as will, of course, constantly keep our towns in great confusion, make the inhabitants extremely unhappy, and will assuredly, in the event, be repented of most severely. For if the accursed tea should once gain such a footing as this in America, our situation would be deplorable, as we should then be at the precarious mercy of others, and incontestably forfeit, by rapid degrees, our invaluable blessings, our birthright, liberty, property, and peace. From an old prophet. News from Hartford, Connecticut. Middletown, Connecticut. Banks of the Mississippi. 
Last Sunday sailed for Middletown the sloop adventurer, Wait Goodrich Master, with about 30 passengers to settle on the banks of the Mississippi. Marlborough, December 13, 1773, House of Sickness. We hear from Marlborough that on December 12th, Mrs. Emmons, widow of Deacon Emmons, late of East Haddam, and mother of Mrs. Horsford, deceased, has died. She made the six corpse carried out of the house of the late Mr. Daniel Horsford since October last, and several more of that family are dangerously sick. Tis remarkable that Mr. Horsford lived about forty years, and had eleven children, and never has a moment's sickness in this family till last October. Behold, a house of joy and gladness turned into a house of illness and sadness, and scarce one left, able at present to make lamentations. John Ensign the person who lately broke open and robbed the house of Mr. Thompson of this place was yesterday sentenced by the Superior Court to ten years' imprisonment in Simsbury Mines, now called Newgate Prison, agreeable to a late act of the General Assembly of this colony. Baltimore, November 27, 1773. Native American Ambush by a gentleman of credit lately from New River in Virginia, we have the following tragical account. That on the 20th of last month, a party of 10 men, two of whom were black men, proceeded on their way from Hudson's River to the Great Falls of the Ohio. Two of the company went into the woods in quest of game. The rest continued their journey till they arrived at their camp where in the night they were surprised and fired upon by about 25 Native Americans supposed to be Cherokees. Five of the white men were killed and the six escaped. The two black men were carried off along with two horses which were the property of Captain William Russell. As the two men who parted from the company have not since been heard of, it is supposed they, together with a few families then traveling towards the falls, have fallen prey. News from Europe! Europe, September 7th, 1773, Austrian Army Upgrade. The last augmentation ordered to be made in the Austrian Army not having appeared sufficient to answer the object proposed to keep up a body of 40,000 men in Poland, even after the public tranquil tranquility shall be reestablished there, fresh orders are given to raise 24,000 soldiers. By means of these successive augmentations, the Austrian army will soon consist of 280,000 men. Barcelona, September 11, 1773, Spanish Man of War. A Spanish Man of War has taken a Barbary Corsair in the Mediterranean and carried her into Barcelona. There was another in company, but the second broadside she received some shot went through her sides, upon which she sunk immediately and all on board perished. Gibraltar, August 2nd, 1773, Russian frigate attacked. A Russian frigate of 40 guns, called the Alexowitz, M. Darshvchen, commander, has just arrived here with an Algerine Zebek, mounting 18 guns and a Tunisian galley of 16 oars on a side. These two vessels attack the Alexowitz off Tetuan, not thinking her a force, as she is a very compact, well-built ship, but soon finding their mistake, were taken after a short resistance. Our governor will not permit the two vessels to be sold here, as England is in amity with the two powers they belong to, and it might be deemed a breach of treaty. Tripoli, 1773. Assassination in Tripoli. Advices from Tripoli, by way of Gibraltar, say that the Dey had been assassinated and his palace burnt by order of the Turkish Bashaw, who presides there, and has the power of levying a tribute from the subjects notwithstanding the Dey is elected or deposed by the soldiery. London, September 18, 1773. Commerce Regulation Scheme a scheme for the better regulation of the commerce between Great Britain and the colonies is now before the Board of Trade and will be laid before Parliament. London, September 20th, 1773. Money in the Bank. Last Friday, $30,000 brought from Jamaica in the Guadalupe Man of War are due from the estates of the late Edward Manning and George Papley ever since 1756 were lodged in the bank. 
Algiers, September 18th, 1773, Christian Slave Uprising. Letters from Algiers mention that the Christian slaves in that city, to the number of 400, rose on June 17th and killed their guards and were proceeding to the day's palace, but, in after, but after an hour's carnage, the insurrection was quelled. Algiers, September 18th, 1773, French frigate sunk. The Comet, a large French frigate of 36 guns and 300 men from St. Domingo, bound to Dunkirk, was lost on September 14th in a very hard gale of wind on the rocks of Sicily, and most of her crew perished. Dunkirk, 1773, fortifying France. The French are very busy in repairing their fortifications at Dunkirk, and the garrisons of all the frontier towns are ordered to be augmented. Marseille, France, August 22, 1773. Prophecy of Enoch. Letters from Paris mention that the sewer guise of the Academy at Marseille, secretary to the French king, has had the honor to present his majesty on the part of the chevalier James Bruce, a celebrated English traveler, with whom he corresponded in a Abyssinian manuscript, which contains the prophecy of Enoch. His Majesty has ordered that this manuscript, of which St. Jerome makes mention, and which the late Sior, Colbert, had searched for in vain, shall be deposited in his library. Leghorn, or Livorno, Italy, August 22, 1773. Peace on the Horizon. Several are of opinion that the peace between the belligerent powers is near at hand, but we are informed, and from good authority, that nothing is farther from the inclinations of the Divan than to agree to the terms proposed by the Russians in the two late Congresses, as the port was never in such a situation for carrying on a war, nor ever had such powerful fleets and armies. The Turks have not less than 300,000 men well disciplined with plenty of provisions and all kind of warlike stores, and their fortresses are in the best situation. Whereas the whole Russian army does not amount to above 120,000 men, and those mostly Cossacks, so that it is impossible for the Russians to gain any advantage over the Turks unless assisted by the Allies. In the meantime, we must soon hear of a peace being concluded not very advantageous to Russia, or of war being declared by the Emperor and the King of Prussia against the Turks. England, foreign sailors. The large body of seamen, which assembled a few days ago on Tower Hill and in Stepney Fields, met to consult on examining all English outward-bound ships for foreign sailors, whom the captains now employ instead of Englishmen as they serve for less money. They also intended to go up to the king with a petition for relief, but Justin Sh Justice Sherwood, went to them and represented the absurdity of going up to the king and the dangerous consequences of riots on the river, upon which they quietly dispersed. Scotland, Poppy Seed Slumber. By a letter from Barrow Stones, near Edinburgh, we had the following remarkable instance of somnolency. Which happened at that place, a man who was employed as a reaper, having eaten some of the seed of the wild poppy, was thrown into a profound sleep, which continued for eight days without the least intermission, Many methods were fallen upon to wake him, but all to no effect. Till at last, by jolting him for some time in a cart, he came to himself. He complained of sickness and called for drink, which was administered to him. He recovered so well as to be able to walk up to Lin Linlithgow a few miles away. England, September 25th, 1773, a gift from Tripoli. Yesterday there was but a thin levy at St. James when the new Tripoline minister was introduced to His Majesty and most graciously received, after which His Majesty viewed in the royal gardens of St. James six fine Arabian horses and four mares, computed to be worth say, altogether 10,000 guineas, being a present from the day of Algiers to His Majesty. They were viewed by several of the nobility, among whom was Lord March, who, being an adept, valued them at the above price. England, a selfish archbishop. Never, says a correspondent, were there two more opposite characters than the present and the late Archbishop of Canterbury. 
the former centering all his views and wishes in self, the latter having made the good of his fellow creatures his object. England, friend or foe. The King of France, we hear, lately declared in the presence of many of his couriers that he was determined, if possible, to remain at peace with England during the term of his life, but this, some say, was only a piece of French policy to mislead us. England, a sharp decline. It is notorious that within these ten years the people have been universally more expensive than our fathers were at the close of the last century. There are more equipages kept, yet there are more taxes. There are more diversions and more want. There are more gentlemen who keep shops and more bankrupts in the Gazette. There are more ladies of taste, but fewer housewives. There is more ostentation, but less substance. More pomp, but less hospitality. More expense and less frugality. Our public debts are increased without our public credit. Public dependency without public spirit. And public offices without public economy. What will be the consequence of all these things in a short time every man of reflection must be too sensible of? And that's all for this week's episode of It's Old News 250. Check back next week for more stories from the past on It's Old News. And also wanted to make an announcement that uh, going forward, It's Old News 250 will be available in both a podcast form on all of the major podcast apps and also uh, as the video series uh, on YouTube on the channel It's Old News. Uh, if you also want to send any emails to us, you can send an email to usahistory250 at gmail.com. All right, see you next week.